everyone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Oh, you flipped it on me. I'm doing good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am very well, thank you. Very, very well. Yes, we're doing we're we're doing I think better this time this this week in quarantine. <laughs> I, I think everybody's adjusted to quarantine life uh, a little bit better uh, than maybe we had in the first few weeks. I think we've just accepted the fact that this is what it is and we're making the best of it, making the most of it, and uh, maybe just being grateful for what we have rather than belly aching about what we don't have. With you still working the front lines, like I say, thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I still say, personally, I still say that this is what I signed up for, and I would rather thank uh, the people who didn't sign up to be at work during a pandemic. A very, very good point. Yeah. And I, ap I appreciate that you do say a lot about that. I think that's amazing. It just shows how much, why we're friends. <laughs> yeah. How much I appreciate you. That's so, it's, it's very helpful to know that, like, Honestly, you know, healthcare workers, we, we've talked about, you know, you signed up for it. It's, it's what you expected to do when something bad happens or trauma happens. You're there to, you know, pick up the pieces, so to speak. But someone who works in a grocery store, who's a delivery driver or a truck driver or anything, didn't sign up for that. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you to all of you. Yeah. I appreciate so much the healthcare providers that are still out there working uh, I really, really do. I don't want to discount anything that anybody's doing. But like I said, we did sign up for this. And um, I had such great appreciation, probably equal or greater than for the young lady today. I just went shopping uh, for groceries a little while ago. This young lady was out front cleaning um, carts, uh, grocery yeah. carts by hand, wearing a mask and gloves. Mm -hmm. And she didn't sign up for that. You know what I yeah. mean? And I was so grateful to her. Um, because I, not knowing or just not thinking about the fact that they had separated like ones that have been uh, cleaned from ones that hadn't been cleaned as far as the carts go, um, I just went to, you know, the first one that came to me, she's like, no, no, sir, here, here, these, these have been cleaned, these have been disinfected. Oh, wow. And I was like, you know what, I appreciate you and what you're doing so much. Thank you. Um, and I really, really do. I really wow. do. Because again, she didn't sign up for that, but she's doing it without complaint. Yeah, that's so, amazing. That's yeah, super so amazing. I appreciate that. I also want to take a moment to appreciate the queens, kings, and folks who are joining us again for another episode of the Slay Queens podcast, the podcast where we, Ashley, take a deep dive into the dark side of the rainbow. <laughs> we absolutely do. Um, today on the show, we will be featuring a gentleman by the name of Ashley. Um, you know very appropriately named <laughs> Juan, <laughs> Juan Corona, which Juan I have two Corona. things. I have two things to say about this. Number one is what we had talked about before. We always have like this running list of, you know, the people that we want to talk about and we try to divide them by like, you know, you don't want to do like two serial killers in a row. You don't want to do two yeah. like stalking cases in a row, all of that. Um, you, you want variety. So he's been on our list for a while, but we've kind of bumped him and bumped him. He's in, he's kind of in his spot now. And how perfect of a spot to be in <laughs> when your name is Corona. The other during, thing I was going to add it during, obviously. The Corona pandemic, yes. <laughs> the Corona pandemic, COVID-19, when I want to feel smart, you know. Um, the other thing being, I actually said to my fiance, I almost said girlfriend, <laughs> It'll take a I little bit of adjustment. Right? I didn't yeah. realize, though, that even that Corona was a Mexican last name. Okay. I had no idea. It was something that I learned from learning this, this gentleman, you know, born in the 50s, mm -hmm. raised in the 70s, had no idea. I just, I thought it was just, you know, a Hispanic word, not even a name. So yeah. I learned two things. Yay. We learn <laughs> new things every day. Yes. Yes, and uh, I guess before we dive into who Juan Corona is and why he's being featured on our little podcast today, do we have anybody that we would like to shout out? Oh yeah, we did that backwards, didn't we? We didn't do the per use. <laughs> <laughs> it's been my fault. I've been all <laughs> off today, so I apologize. I mean, half the time I don't even know what day it is. I mean, it's day, I think we wrote like 1276 for day whatever of quarantine because okay. we're just like no clue. Yeah. 
Um, anyways, so yeah, our shout outs would be, we just did a little interview with we did. Uh, Murder, Murder amazing. News. Yeah, she was amazing. Yeah, it was Murder, Murder News. Her name's Aurora, which I absolutely, we had to talk about that. <laughs> <We> <laughs> love her name. Uh, it was great. She was wonderful. And, you know, thank you so much for having us on the show and loved it. It was nice loved to it. conversate. Yeah. It was a great time. It was a great interview. It was a great experience. She was a great host and mm -hmm. just gracious and beautiful and fun. And thank you, thank you so much from all of us here at the Slay Queens podcast. Yes, thank you. All right, do we want to get into this then? Let's go for it. All Let's right. talk about the, uh, the machete murderer, Juan The machete Juan murderer, Juan Corona. Now, I learned about uh, this particular individual reading some publications on thoughtco.com, also criminalminds.fandom.com, which is a website I'd never been on before, and I'm obsessed with it now, so I encourage everyone to check it out. It's funny then, you bring that up, because I ended up on that site at one point, Yeah, too. yeah, they had, <laughs> they had a great write-up about him. And I also found a really, really, really interesting piece on latinamericanstudies.org. So those are my sources. Uh, what about you, Ashley? Well, I mean, my first source will always be Wikipedia, of course. <laughs> and then <laughs> I did watch um, ID, it was a docuseries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called The Most Infamous, which was Juan Corona added in. I, like I said, we talked about it. I don't know what episode number or anything like that, but it was, uh, you know, investigation discovery. And it was just, if you type in that with Juan Corona, it's, it's great. It's, it's probably the most, the best documentary I watched, which is why I'm crediting that one. Yeah, it was a good one. I, I watched, I didn't watch all of it. I watched bits, bits and pieces because I had such good information uh, from the publications that I had read already. Mm -hmm. But shall we? Yeah, well, even in watching that 45 minutes, I was like, how did I not know more about this guy? We discussed that uh, when we weren't recording about how yeah. based on the brutality of his crimes and the sheer like victim count, we were both surprised that we didn't know more about this particular individual uh, mm -hmm. prior to studying up on him to present him uh, on the podcast today. So here we go. So here we go. Uh, <laughs> I do have an opening. Uh, just to give a little taste, and then we'll really dive into uh, the story. Juan Corona was a contractor who recruited migrant laborers to work uh, in fruit farms in California. In a blood-stained murder spree lasting approximately six weeks in 1971, Corona raped and murdered 25 men and then buried their hatchet-hacked bodies in orchards, uh, in the orchards in which they worked. Say that six times fast. Yeah, <laughs> I could barely say it one time, slowly. Why he decided to begin killing is a mystery and one that psychologists pondered. Most believe that Corona probably had a history of homophobia, sexual assault, and victimizing the individuals who worked for him. Some attribute Corona's crimes to his need to dominate and control his victims. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And I still, I mean, I have a couple of different opinions, but we'll get there. <laughs> Absolutely. Feel free to interject anytime you would like. Uh, so who is Juan Corona? Let's talk a little bit about his background first. Uh, Juan Corona was born in rural, I always managed to, to get ah! that word in somewhere, uh, rural Mexico on February the 7th of 1934 to parents Sebastian and Candida Corona. Uh, between his parents and his father's first marriage, Corona was raised with 13 siblings, which, I mean, I was raised with two siblings and that drove me insane. So I can only imagine what it was like to be raised with uh, it's, 13 siblings. It's so funny when someone ever says there's more than like, I don't know, five siblings. I'm like, were they Catholic? <laughs> it's always <laughs> my question. Well, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the per use in Cincinnati. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so that's usually where my mind goes as well. Uh, in 1950, when he was 16 years old, Corona actually dropped out of high school and immigrated to California, where he began to work on farms in the Imperial and Sacramento Valley. So this is kind of the northern part of uh, uh, California, which I, was a, which I was a little bit surprised by, because when I was initially just skimming the information uh, about this case, I guess I just made an assumption that he was in uh, Southern California, but he actually spent the majority of his time more north. It's funny that you say that because 
honestly, I thought the same thing. I, yeah. until you just said that, I, I thought the same thing. Cause I mean, yeah. you say you were born in Mexico, you would assume if you made it into California, you're just going to stay in Southern. No, why would you yeah. go other places? Yeah. Especially if you have a uh, family uh, still in Mexico, maybe it would be convenient for you to, to visit them. But yeah, he, yeah. Uh, he settled in a, a more Northern part of the state. Uh, in addition to working full-time, Corona also managed to attend night school to gain fluency in the English language. In May of 1953, Corona settled in Marysville, Yuba City uh, metropolitan area, following his half-brother Navidad's invitation to live with him. Navidad had immigrated from Mexico to that area years before and had become the owner-operator of a restaurant called the Guadalajara Cafe. And I read a couple of different accounts that said Navidad was actually also an openly gay man, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of, um, it's, it's ballsy for the time. Absolutely. And also, Absolutely. And also interesting considering some of the things that we're going to learn about Juan. I mean, it's kind of like a, it's an interesting thing to know. Just keep that, put a pin in that. Put a pin in that. <laughs> put a pin in that. Yes. In late December, 1955, a flood in the Yuba and up the Yuba and Feather Rivers broke the levee and flooded much of the Sacramento Valley, including large sections of Yuba City and Maryville. In fact, Maryville was declared a total loss at the time and it was completely evacuated. The flood killed a total of 38 people, many of whom were undocumented laborers hired to fix known or existing problems with the levee, which is, is pretty tragic. You know, they were there to fix this levy because they knew that it wasn't in good shape and that it wouldn't hold up under, you know, the circumstances of something like a flood. And then it didn't. And it killed these poor people who were trying to fix the problem. It's literally, it, it, it should have been involved in that Alanis Morissette ironic song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Isn't it? Like, yes. When I heard that, isn't it ironic? I'm like, yeah. those poor... It, which none of those things are ironic. They're just shitty situations, but yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, tragic situations. Exactly. Yeah. This event had a profound effect on Corona, who had always been afraid of the water. He suffered a mental breakdown, coming to believe that everyone in the area had died uh, from the flooding and that the survivors he was seeing were actually ghosts. On January 17th of 1956, Navidad had Corona committed to a mental health hospital in Auburn, California, where he was diagnosed as uh, being paranoid schizophrenic. After receiving 23, count them, 23 electroshock treatments over the period of three months. Holy shit. Barbaric. Just barbaric. I didn't barbaric. know it was that many. I mean, I knew he had quite a few, but like when you say quite a few, you think like three or four? <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. Okay. This is multiple a week. That's, what? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> after, after he received those treatments, he was declared recovered and then deported back to Mexico because I guess he had originally entered the country uh, illegally, air quotes illegally. Sure. He actually, though, would return to California legally later that year. Then in 1959, Juan Corona married a woman by the name of Gloria, and the two would go on to have four daughters together. Despite his violent temper, excessive interest in showing off his masculinity, and well-known <laughs> issues with openly gay men, Corona established himself as a trusted worker and businessman in the community. In 1962, he became licensed as a labor contractor and hired workers to staff local fruit ranches. In March of 1970, Corona actually had another documented schizophrenic episode and was briefly institutionalized. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, so he went I didn't back. even know about that. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Though there were no other known issues with his mental health during this time, Corona was suspect in the attack of a young man by the name of Jose Romero Rea. On May 25th of 1970, Jose Rea, a young Mexican man, was found in the restroom of the Guadalajara Cafe, having been struck about the head and face with a machete. Ugh. How do you strike, some, strike someone with a machete? Like, that doesn't even yeah. sound right. Rea was unable to identify his attacker, but Juan Corona, along with his brother Navidad, were the only other known people in the restaurant at the time of the attack. The police could not find sufficient evidence to charge either man with the crime, so Rea filed suit against Navidad because he was the owner of the establishment. Right. 
All right, so he was actually awarded a $250,000 settlement uh, for his injuries. And Navidad, who was unable to pay that, said, you know what, I'm just gonna sell all of my property in California and I'm gonna move my ass back to Mexico. So that's what he did. Bye. <laughs> like, <see you. laughs> hey, bye. Hey, bye. <laughs> I'm done. Exactly. All right. So essentially, this poor man was attacked with a machete. He couldn't identify who had attacked him, but it was one of two people. It was either Juan Corona or his brother. Uh, brother got slapped with the $250,000 fine. Uh, he said, you know what? I can't afford to pay this. He sold all of his uh, properties, moved back to Mexico. Juan, however, stayed because he had an established life uh, in that area. Yeah, he had a family at this point, right? He had a family. He was a respected member of the community. He had a business where he worked as a labor contractor. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about him. Yeah. Yeah. He was an oddity at this time. It was a Mexican, Mexican American immigrant who was doing well for himself doing during well this time. Himself. Yeah. Was not pretty much unheard of. Yeah. Yeah. This was 1970, 1971. Mm -hmm. So good for him or seemingly at least. Absolutely. Right. Um, let's talk about May 19th of 1971. Uh, on that date, a Japanese American farmer found a large freshly dug hole measuring approximately seven feet in length. Uh, by three feet in depth on the property of a peach orchard that he owned. The next day, the man asked his employees, uh, who were actually employees that he had contracted through Juan Corona Services, about the hole. They knew nothing about it. Later that night, the farmer returned to the orchard and found that the hole had been filled, strangely. Huh. Huh. So what did he do? He contacted the sheriff immediately. Uh, law enforcement showed up, they dug up the hole, and they found the body of a known drifter named Kenneth Whitaker. So, talk about premeditation, right? Like, somebody discovers the hole before there's even a body in it. Honest to God, knock me out, I thought the same thing. It was like, it kind of was reminiscent of the, uh, what was the grinder killer that had like the pro like the 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 file for his victim that he oh was Bruce found. MacArthur Bruce, Bruce MacArthur. MacArthur it was Bruce yeah. MacArthur that's who it was he literally had a, a a file already saved for the pictures he was going to take of the victim that was in his bed not yet dead like that's it's next level vomit. premeditation honestly yes. I think That's we joked about it even at the time. If, uh, if premeditated murder is first degree, this is like a 0.5 degree murder. Yes! <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> All right. Um, so the man that they found was easily identified as Kenneth Whitaker because he was a known drifter uh, in the area. Though Whitaker was dressed, the deputies found gay literature in his pockets. Uh, it was also obvious the man, that the man had been sexually assaulted, he had been stabbed, and someone had split his head open with a large bladed object. A large bladed object. Split his head open. So <laughs> does it sound familiar at all? Oh, <laughs> uh, what, would, what would do that? <laughs> what would do that? Let's just ponder that question as we move forward a little bit. Then on May the 24th, workers driving uh, a tractor at an adjoining fruit ranch spotted what appeared to be another filled grave. They also alerted the sheriff who dug up another male body and in the process found yet another place where the earth had been disturbed. That spot also contained a third body. These two victims were known male drifters and farm workers who had been sexually assaulted, stabbed, and hacked in the same manner as the first body with a large bladed object. However, buried with the third victim, police also discovered two receipts from a Yuba City meat market. It was dated for May 21st and signed by, care to take a guess, Ashley? Who might it be? <laughs> <laughs> One Juan Corona. One Juan Corona. Which is just messy. Like, if you're going to go to all the trouble of this premeditation, digging holes before you even choose and kill your victims, y you left two receipts with your name on them with but the victim's body? We also say this too, like we also say like too, like are you that stupid or are you that cocky? Like have you gotten away with these two other murders for so long that you don't think about these other things or? Is it ignorance or arrogance? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. That's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Snaps for that, Ashley. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. 
with this evidence, though, the sheriff's office was reluctant to make an arrest before the real number of victims was known. So they continued to search the area for graves. Six additional bodies were located in that very same orchard. I need you to pause for a second. Okay. Because <laughs> my favorite part, there's a couple like little comments from the, uh, the documentary that I watched that like made me laugh a little bit. And okay, it was a small police department. Like they even admitted, they were like, we would be completely incompetent if we didn't have other people coming in once we discovered, you know, more than one body kind of thing. Yeah. And the one officer, he just made me laugh so hard because he was like, you know, we knew we probably had an issue after like body five was discovered. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> he says that, he says that. And then like, it takes about, I don't know, five seconds before he's like, you know, in like a mass murder aspect. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you for that. Like I had to go back and rewatch it. Like, can you really say after body five, they knew they had an issue? <laughs> what? Yeah. Not an FBI guy, that one. I'm Definitely assuming. not. <laughs> a very nice, very helpful gentleman, but not prepared for this. Exactly, exactly. God bless him. All right, so the men, the victims, were, for the most part, known drifters uh, to the area, known alcoholics, social dropouts, and misfits. Described by investigators as, quote, the kind of people who would not ordinarily be missed if they vanished, end quote which is so <laughs> sad. Like I would hope and pray that I never reach a point in my life where somebody describes me in even a similar way. Would deem you as that? Like I might show up like dead in my house one day and someone's like, well, no one noticed because nobody cared. Exactly. You know, that's exactly. terrible. That's awful. Yeah. Many of the victims were known to have asked Corona for work or had actually been seen riding in his pickup truck prior to their deaths. Juan Corona had apparently started to single out workers or his workers for sex, murdering the men after the sexual encounters or even when they declined his advances. His work as a labor contractor and his twisted inclinations gave Corona ample opportunities to prey on vulnerable men. His position in the community uh, and the victim's lack of position or social standing would have ensured that the police were not informed of the disappearances and that Juan Corona would not be considered a suspect. So to me, actually, this is very reminiscent, now that I'm thinking about it and the way you're presenting it, different from how I read it, very much like Gacy in a way. Yes, yes. I, I felt that there were a lot of similarities yes. between the two. I never actually really considered that. I mean, one time I did think a little bit like, okay, he hires, you know, contractors that might be seemingly unknowing to being disappeared, I guess, or them missing, so no one would know. Um, but yeah, now that you're saying it the way that you're presenting it, I'm like, it's kind of identical. Yeah, It's a different scenario, but it's the same idea of like hiring these weaker individuals and I that think nobody would miss. Quote, exactly. So and I think, I mean, we're going to get into it a little bit more with this part of uh, sure. the podcast, but I think it's a lot of similar motivation in the fact that this is a person who is struggling uh, with his sexuality and he's yeah. angry because he's struggling with his sexuality. So he somehow justifies what he's doing by like dominating these people and then punishing them by taking their lives. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. So it's, it's this whole like homophobic, self-loathing, closet case, like kind of energy that's, mm -hmm. I think, pushing him to commit these crimes. And for me, that's how I've always viewed Gacy and his crimes. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about this and the day that Juan was arrested. On May 26th, deputies arrested Juan Corona and searched his home and office. Uh, as well as his pickup truck. Among the evidence found was an 18-inch machete, ding, 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 there we have it, <laughs> a blood-stained club, knives, a pistol with ammunition. One of the victims had also been shot, by the way. Uh, as oh, well I didn't know as, that. Yeah, one of the victims had been shot in the head, as well as digging material in a ledger, where we heard this before, a ledger documenting the names of 34 different male victims, along with what they later proposed or assumed to be the dates that he had met and killed them. Where have we heard that one before? Hello. I mean, this Albert ledger, Della. 
Yeah, I mean, this ledger, I mean, which is so funny that you just brought that up. Like, to me, when I was hearing about the ledger, when I was, I watched documentaries, I mostly listened to them, so I'm cooking or doing something mm -hmm. else. But when I heard about the ledger, I was like, oh my God, here are his blood slides, his trophies. Like, this is literally his planning. This is all mm -hmm. of how he's accounting for. Yeah, this is the Dexter Morgan aspect of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the tale. Okay, uh, and there were also blood stains, uh, blood stains found inside of his pickup truck. So this is all the evidence that they have against him at this point. As a result of all of that, <laughs> <laughs> the sheriff ordered aircraft to take infrared photos of the area to possibly locate more graves. The search concluded on June 4th of 1971, having literally unearthed a total of 25 victims. That number was twice the body count of the Boston Strangler, who at the time was the most prolific serial killer in American history. I guess that's true, because I was trying to think of like time span, because we've talked about, obviously, Gacy, and mm -hmm. we've talked about, um, oh my god. Oh, Donna this Harvey. is Johnny guy. Don Harvey, thank Donald you. Don Harvey, yeah. Um, this is still less, but he's before them, so exactly. that makes sense. Yeah. There's always somebody that beats out the next person. <laughs> it's like you bring it on. She's like, I define being the best as competing against the best and winning. <laughs> That's the serial killer mindset right here. <laughs> yeah, for real, for sure. Uh, though a total of 1,500 people contacted authorities to report missing relatives as possible victims of Juan Corona, four of the 25 victims have to this day never been identified. That's really sad. Pretty sad. Yeah. Yeah. But at least there were 21 that were identified. And his ledger actually documented 34 different um, victims. Maybe those weren't all people that he killed. We don't know because he didn't document details like Bob Berdella, who literally went line by line, word for word, this is what I did to these people. These were just or names, names and dates. These were yeah. names and dates. Yeah. So maybe these were people that he just raped. Uh, or attempted to victimize and he didn't kill them, or maybe he didn't kill all of his victims, um, or maybe they just didn't locate all of the bodies. Yeah, or those people could be people that maybe it was some kind of attack that they don't want to talk about. That's true. They That's don't want to be contacted. Yeah, we've know? seen that. We've seen that in a couple of the other cases, especially cases where there was like a sexual assault involved, like sure. prior to like the, the murder, people who were sexually assaulted that maybe got away they don't want to talk about it, especially from this time. Oh, hell, if I were, if I were, I've always thought about this. If I were like a victim of, you know, a, a, a mass serial killer and I got away, or, you know, it was my parent or my brother or my sister or whatever it may be, I don't, I would probably completely change my name and be a totally different person because I don't want to be involved with that. You know, I don't want people yeah. to know that about me. I can understand why someone would do that. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I have, I actually watched, interestingly enough, watched a documentary. I do not remember the name of the victim. That's okay, that's okay. It's something that I just watched really randomly. And she said that the worst part about having been, she, she was a, a, a person who had been kidnapped and then she, she wasn't killed, but like other thing, other forms of abuse happened and then she ultimately got away. She said the worst part about everything that's happened now that she's away from it and she's safe and she's you know living uh, her life is that she will always be associated as being the victim of that crime. Yep. And people will Absolutely. never really know her as anything else. So it's kind of like you were saying and the fact that you don't want to be associated with that. You don't want to mm -hmm. live with that label for the rest of your life. So I can appreciate that. To me, I literally think of like when they were making that dumb book I shouldn't say dumb, but to me, whatever. Fifty Shades of Grey, when they were making it a movie, someone had to be Christian Grey. Who's going to play that role? It can't be someone, like, they had uh, the guy from Sons of Anarchy playing him, and he dropped out, like, a month before. He said he didn't want to be typecast anymore. Okay. It's the same idea. Yeah. It's once you've played Christian Grey, once you've played Harry Potter, once you've played these roles, you're not going to be that per a different person aside from yeah. that. So it's the same thing, only it's real life and it's your actual trauma that you're gonna be reminded of all the time. Yeah, yeah, so and it's hard. It's it. hard for anybody, real life or in kind of the way that you're talking about actors and actresses, it's almost impossible to reinvent yourself 
once you've been given that label. Yep. Yeah. So food for thought. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about what happened uh, in the end. Yep. Uh, Juan Corona initially was provided a public defender who hired several psychiatrists to evaluate his mental health uh, and his mental state in order to pursue a not guilty by reason of insanity plea. However, on June 14th of 1971, that attorney was replaced by a man named Richard Hawk, who was a private lawyer that took up the case in exchange for exclusive literary and dramatic rights to Juan Corona's life story and the legal proceedings. Uh, now, what does that sound like? Eileen. Eileen, exactly. And it's, I mean, he obviously committed these crimes and deserves the full weight of the law and the full punishment of the law for them. But it's also like bad deeds don't justify bad deeds. So someone sure, coming absolutely. in and taking advantage of this person just because he is a murderer still isn't okay. Especially for someone like where I feel like, I don't know, I don't know them personally, obviously, but Juan Corona and someone like Annihilate Warnos, I feel the mental issues that they have are not something that you can fix just by talking to someone. They have issues that they need to balance out with when it comes to medication or like certain things, right? Yeah. So when you come in and like you, I don't know, you want to sympathize for them, but you really can't yeah. in a way, yeah. you know? These people need help, but obviously they weren't gonna get it and they just lashed out and how do we figure that out from here on out? You, you get empathy, but like, or sympathy, definitely no empathy with this guy. Yeah. Sympathy, but it's like, what are we supposed to do better? You know what I mean? Yeah, I just, I don't like the way this, this particular aspect of the story shook out because it's not okay to victimize someone just because they victimized other people. Ah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make the situation any better. So what had happened was- What had uh, happened was- That particular lawyer, Richard Hawk, decided not to pursue the insanity plea. He fired all the psychiatrists. Uh, he made no mention of the fact that Corona had a previous history and like an actual medical diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. And he called huh. no witnesses in Juan Corona's defense. What? Yeah. So he really was no lawyer to him at all. So there's a lot of, okay, well, I mean, Eileen went through the same thing, but the whole trial, that's one thing I didn't really know that much about, but there's a lot of other things with, when it comes to this trial that are really <laughs> fucked up when it comes to evidence and when it comes to testimonials and things like that. I had no idea that that was even part of it. Yeah. Well, wow. that was the initial trial. Uh, right, the right, trial right, right, right. was underway on February 18th of 1972. Corona was ultimately found guilty, shocker, shocker, of all of the charges on January all 18th. 25 accounts, though. Mm -hmm. All 25. That doesn't happen ever. Well, it happened here because there was literally no defense. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. mean, yeah. I and guess I didn't realize that's why that's ha that's why that happened. That's yeah. so funny. I didn't. I had no idea. Yeah, January 18th of 1973, he was sentenced to 25 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Literally guilty of all the charges against him. Well, I mean, it was a jury trial. So it was yes. like these people had to decide, is this, and that never happens. We've talked so many times about serial killers and how it's like, oh, they said they killed 48 people or 30 people or 20 something people and they get convicted of like seven or 11 exactly. or 12 because the jury, it's like they, they empathize or they, they don't want to do wrong to the person, but at the end of the day, it's still like life sentences. Yeah. But he got 25 life sentences. That's insane. Yeah. You don't hear that ever. Well, let's talk about this. So in 1978, uh, Corona's first attorney was ruled incompetent and he was granted a retrial. Mm -hmm. which I mean, I, again, I'm he not, was incompetent. He was 100% incompetent. I am not upholding Juan Corona in any of the wrong that he did. I would never do that. I think it's despicable the way that he victimized uh, people just because he maybe was struggling with his own mental health sexuality. issues and his own sexuality. Exactly. 
But do I think that our justice system as it is says that it will provide this person with adequate counsel and an adequate defense attorney? Yes. And that did not happen. He did not get a fair trial. Initially. Everyone should get a fair trial. Exactly. We've always agreed on that. Yes. Uh, so he was granted a retrial because the initial uh, attorney was found to be incompetent. His new attorney was a man by the name of Terrence Hallinan. This man called over 50 witnesses in Corona's defense. And his strategy actually was he was attributing the murders to Navidad, who had previously died in Mexico in 1973. Um, he actually cited Jose Romero Reyes's case in 1970, the lawsuit against Navidad. He claimed that Navidad had a history of violence, had a history of wielding a machete, and was a known homosexual. So he fit the bill for the perpetrator of these crimes. Huh? Yeah, but <laughs> go ahead. I'm just saying, yeah, you can fit a bill. Things yeah. can look good on paper, right? Exactly. And I'm sure you've easy... dated someone in your past that looked good on paper that didn't actually fit the bill. Yeah. And it was easy to make a case against this person who was no longer alive to defend themselves, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially when it's, uh, it's someone who, when I was even watching that documentary, it was like, there were certain people who did not want to or at all believe that this guy could have done these things because he was a family man and he was part of you know the society and he was so well known and so well renowned but gacy 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 exactly <laughs> exactly so how easy would it be to just pin it on someone else who obviously has a history of this that and the other thing yeah exactly exactly but we know the world doesn't always work that way all right, so the defense actually could not prove that Navidad was still in California at the time of most of the murders. Because he had, like we discussed previously, he had long since sold all of his property uh, mm -hmm. in California and moved back to Mexico. And for all intents and purposes, as far as we know, he stayed there until the time of his death. So they couldn't place him in California during that six week period of time uh, that all of these crimes or these murders were known to be. Committed. Well, and there were no cell phones and cell phone towers back then. There were no, you know, cameras everywhere and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So that was the defense's case. The prosecution yeah. built their case heavily around the testimony from a Mexican consulate employee who had met Corona in jail in 1978 while he was preparing an appeal for Corona's case. Um, according to this man, Corona admitted to the killings, stating, quote, yes, I did it, but I'm a sick man, and a sick man can't be judged by the same standards as other men. Huh. And how pensive is that? I, I mean, go that's, ahead. I, I don't even know what to say about that. I don't know why I'm talking before you are, because it's like, what? Like, it's so smart but also so creepy and so like you know you're fucked up basically yeah. it's i i when i talked to my boyfriend about it when i talked to hunter about it when i read this quote i was like this is the most profound thing i think i've ever heard of any serial killer saying and i imagine it has to be what most of them feel like at least uh -huh. at some point they yeah. have to go i know that i'm committing these crimes i know that i'm a sick man but you can't judge me the same way that you would judge a normal person because we're not the same. It no, just, it's absolutely true. Yeah, it just was mind boggling to me and it's just so true. pensive and so thoughtful. And like you said, brilliant, but creepy and sad. It just, it's, yeah, it's so pensive. It's really pensive is the only word to use it for that, honestly. <laughs> I, <agree. laughs> I, I mean, agree. I wanted to say, like, it made me think of, like, Eileen when she was like, well, if you don't murder Eileen, Eileen will murder again. But, like, at yeah. the end of the day, she she wasn't as pensive. It's the only word I can use yeah. to, like, describe that, really, yeah. is she wasn't as eloquent in how she spoke. That's true. Yeah. She was not eloquent in anything that she did as far as ever. I've ever known. <laughs> I don't even think she could pronounce that word. No. She definitely couldn't <laughs> spell it. No. <laughs> no. Okay, so after seven months, the jury found Juan Corona guilty on all counts again. All 25 counts again. Yep. And they sentenced him to live out the remainder of his life in California's Corcoran State 
prison. Juan Corona lived there until March 4th of 2019 when he died at the age of 85 of what was reportedly natural causes. Reportedly. Reportedly natural causes. Who knows though, really? Yeah, I read a couple of things about his his time in prison. Uh, apparently he was stabbed in the eye uh, by prisoners at one point in time. Um, what? There were, yeah, there were a couple of other little things. If you Google, and I can put some of these up on, uh, on the social medias, if you Google images of Juan Corona, uh, of course you'll get like earlier images of him when he was first on trial and whatnot, and then like the later images of him in his life, you can tell that one of his eyes is has has changed it's like droopy almost like a healthcare oh. my healthcare my healthcare worker brain would glance at it and think that maybe he had suffered a stroke but turns out he was stabbed in the eye and he lost vision there and they had to do some reconstructive surgery and whatnot so yeah that was like remember remember a few months ago when i was asking you if you had watched the henry lee lucas yes. docuseries yes that's i think something that happened to him okay i think that's why he was so like wonky in one area but in any case um the big thing about Juan that I wanted to say was that I don't know necessarily how he died but I think it has to have to do a lot with his closeted homosexuality that's one thing we didn't really touch on a whole lot when it came to like this story yeah the big thing is that he probably had these lash out he probably did the things that he did because these people were probably gay or he hated gay men so much yeah he um was known uh even before any of this came out or he was a suspect in these murders he was known to openly have problems uh with gay men um and all of his victims showed some form of like sexual assault or rape uh, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. It's all the red flags and all the signs for someone, especially in the '70s, who is struggling with their own sexuality. And even uh, the thing that um, where people described him as someone who liked to show off his masculinity. These are all red flags for somebody who is struggling with something, compensating for something. I, I mean, I shouldn't speak in in, in definitives, but. It's traditionally, we associate that sort of behavior with men no. who are uncomfortable with their sexuality or sexual identity, things like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like when we talk about like the McDonald's triad, someone might have some of those, you know, identifiers doesn't make them necessarily a serial killer. It's just kind of like de-identifying things, you know what I mean? Exactly. It yeah. doesn't mean it's definitive, like you said. Yeah. And the only, I read a couple of different accounts of Juan Corona's uh, about his sexuality, about his being questioned about his sexuality specifically, um, he maintained uh, that he was not gay, that he was not homosexual, that he didn't have uh, any sort of like sexual attraction uh, or physical attraction to men. Uh, there was one account on one of the publications that I read that said that he had admitted to one homosexual encounter as a teenager in yeah. Mexico before he um, moved to California, but I couldn't substantiate that uh, with more than just the, the one article. Yeah. But again, kind of, kind of like Gacy and the fact that up to like his last day, he denied uh, being homosexual or gay. Any of it, but every single one of your victims was a gay man of yeah. much younger years than you typically. So what yeah. is that? Exactly. So who raped uh, your victims, if not you? Exactly. You know? <laughs> Do you have a complex we haven't found any DNA on, or? Yeah, so that's all I have uh, for Juan Corona, the original coronavirus. The original coronavirus. (laughs) It's real, y'all. It's real, y'all, coronavirus. Coronavirus. Um, So that's all I have. Ashley, do you have anything else? Uh, No, just... Go out and slay, queens. (laughs) We do (laughs) want you all to go out and slay queens, just not each other. And not poor, helpless drifters or people who maybe um, are down. uh, Yeah. Maybe not living their best life. And I think there's a lot of that going on right now. Just don't don't go for the the people that are down on their luck. Yeah. You know, just because you think people won't miss them, someone's going to miss them. Yeah. First and foremost, don't go for anybody, but yeah, well, yeah. don't victimize, <laughs> don't victimize in any way, shape or form. Uh, don't victimize people who are down. 
um, because their lives have just as much value as any of the rest of us. And I think a lot of people are struggling right now. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Everybody is. I think everybody is in their own way. Yeah. And we do want to thank everybody for thank listening you. to us again. Uh, please, please, please do all the nice things on our social medias, uh, which are, where can they find us, Ashley? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Patreon. And then if you want to listen to pretty much everywhere on everywhere podcasts are allowed. That is true. We are also putting these videos up on YouTube now if you want to see how gorgeous Ashley looks. No, uh, that's not true. Those roots, <laughs> girl. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can just, on all the platforms, you can just do a quick search of Slay Queen's Pod and you will find us easily. Yeah. Look at YouTube if you want to see Wayne without short hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with a busted face. I love it, I love it. I'm kind of Thank angry. you. I'm going to let you take care of this for me as soon as uh, we're able to legally do so again. Not much, though. I do want to keep the length. I do want to keep a little bit of the length. I'm, like, I'm here for it. I'm thinking like a short fade around the edge. Of, well, yes, yes. Tune yes. in next for what Same page, want. same page, <laughs> <It's> gal. <laughs> yes, but uh, as uh, my... Uh, my, my best gal has said, go out and slay queens. Just not each other. Just not each other. <laughs> <laughs>